Um, so I would uh, like to uh, introduce uh, Verena, who will be uh, speaking about uh, imperatives and, uh, yes, imperatives and directive speech acts in Ihanzu. So Verena, the floor is yours. Thank you. So my topic is imperatives and directive speech act in Ihanzu. So this is my table of contents, but I won't go into detail about it because um, just in order to save some time. Um, first of all, I'd like to present to you the questions that I had before my um, before I started my research. Um, I wanted to find out if imperatives in the second person singular consist only of the verb stem because um, uh, I was wondering because um, yeah, if there's a zero morpheme as it's the case in most of um, the Indo-European languages as well, and I was interested in that. And furthermore, um, I wanted to find out if Ihanzo has different imperative forms for the singular and the plural you. And I wanted to find out if Ihanzo has a special imperative for adult people that the speaker doesn't know well. I mean, the equivalent for the German du or sie. Um, so I wanted to check if there are different um, forms of addressing people um, who are children, family members, and so on, and or another one who for people the speaker doesn't know. And um, furthermore, I would like to know if uh, how the first person plural imperatives, so the we form, um, are expressed. And if Ihanzo has indirect ways of expressing um, direct speech acts, such as questions or um, also um, similar aspects, and if direct or indirect speech acts, uh, which of those are more commonly used? I wanted to find out. Yeah. And um, another thing that I was specifically interested in was if object pronouns are attached directly to the verb, like, like affixes. Um, because that is the case, um, for instance, in Spanish and also in French. Um, and in order to find out if um, the second person singular imperative only consists of the verb stem, I first of all need to know what the verb stem is. So I asked uh, Nico to give me some um, conjugations of some verbs in the present tense, uh, specifically the present progressive. And um, here are two verbs um, that I asked him. So kuniwa would be the first verb that means to drink, and kulia would mean to eat. And um, yeah, when you look at, uh, at the single forms, you immediately notice that the end is uh, almost always identical um, of the single forms. And the ainamwa, uh, for instance, is always present in the in the forms of the kumwa, um, and the uh, ainalia is always present in the forms of the um, and verbs of the kulia. Oh, yes, and um, what they these forms share with the infinitive um, is the ingwa that is always there. So maybe this could be the stem but um, we would have to um, examine it, it a bit further. So um, another thing that's interesting is that Nico gave me for the third person singular, he gave me two options um, for the kumwa verb. He said wa inangwa and ukumwa. And um, during my research, I found out that um, the second and the third person singular uh, either begins with a W or a U. Um, the U can also be an O. I'm not completely sure about that because it, it sounds so similar. Um, yes. And yeah, as you can see, the, the forms just um, differ in the first morpheme here. So the N is in both cases um, the morpheme for the first person singular and the K, for instance, for the first person plural, and so on. Okay. Yes, yeah, so here are two um, other verbs, um, kulala, which means to sleep, and kuligitia, which means to talk. And here we can also see um, that the first um, morpheme 
um, of the respective uh, uh, person uh, almost always matches, but in uh, here the second and third person singular, it is the, the you at the end, uh, at the beginning again. And um, yes, and the forms that Nico gave me here for Kulala was the first person singular was Nalala, and he gave two options again, Ndal. And then the second and the third, he told me is Ulaya, but it's, there is a difference in the tone, but I'm not real, uh, very good at pronouncing it. So, <laughs> and yes, um, the first person plural is Kulai and then Bulai and Alai. And um, what you can see is that the Lal of the, of the infinitive um, is not completely there. So the L, the second L gets missing. And um, this is because, I mean, at least Andrew told me that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that there is a perfect marker in it, the ile, and that this is very common also in, in Hansel verbs. Mm -hmm. So that the, the actual forms would be ndalile, ndalile, et cetera, and that they are probably just um, contracted and pronounced uh, with a long A ah, and then the, the, uh, at the end, yes. So um, probably the, what you can say is that maybe the lal or the, um, uh, the morpheme after the, the infinitive marker may be um, the stem without the vowel because the vowel is different in, um, in the case of Kulala. I mean vowel at the end. Um, now I'd like to go into more detail with one of one of the verbs, um, and I wanted to explain to you um, the single morphemes. So I'm going to start with um, the infinitive. It's kuwa, and the ku, as I already said, is um, the infinitive marker, and the mu is probably the stem, means drink, and then it's followed by the final vowel a. So, um, and the single forms um, of the respective um, persons um, begin with, all begin with um, the respective um, subject marker here. Uh, the na would be the subject marker for the first person singular, and the wa, for instance, for the second and the third person singular, and so on. And what they all have in common is the ina sound. Um, it probably um, originates from the adverb ino, which means now, um, to express that um, the activity takes place now. And then, um, yeah, the rest of the uh, morphemes they share it with the end of the um, the infinitive. So the at the end. So you could think that um, the moi may be the stem, not just the moi, but um, we will get into that later. And yes, I wanted to um, explain to you the morphemes of the, the second of option of the third person singular as well that he gave me, the ukungwa. The u, uh, as I mentioned earlier, can also be um, the subject marker of the third person singular. And the ku, um, I said earlier that it can be an infinitive marker, but it can also um, be a progressive marker, like the ina is probably as well. Yes, and the rest is the same. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> Now let's have a look at um, at the second person um, singular imperatives um, to check if they only consist of the stems. Um, the verb kungwa to drink uh, has the form nwa. Um, and for kulia it's ya, for kulala it's lala, for kuligitya it's ligitya. And um, so you could think that 
maybe you just have to delete the infinitive marker and then you have the, um, the second person singular imperative and that this is the stem. And if this is the case, then these verbs um, appear to confirm that those imperative forms only consist of the verb stem and no further affixation is needed um, for the listener to understand that the speaker wants him to do something. <laughs> now comes the but. <laughs> um, the, uh, yes. There are verbs like hituma, for instance, and this is not an exception. There are a lot of verbs where the um, second person singular imperative um, ends on an a sound uh, rather than on an a sound. So the vowel gets uh, changed and it's probably the subjunctive form. But why the subjunctive forms used um, would need um, further research as well. Um, and hituma has another special feature in it. Um, because it definitely it, it seems it seems to not start with with a coup with the infinitive marker coup, um, but it's probably as um, Andrew told me <laughs> as well. It's um, pro probably in there. It's just not pronounced, and it's probably ku e tuma, and the e um, stands for a reciprocal or reflexive marker. Yes, but why it's in there it would need more research as well. Yes, and um, then followed by the verb sem tum and the vowel a. Um, yeah, and then it's pronounced kituma. Um, uh, so the in this case and in other cases, the final vowel changes um, from an a to an e at the end in the imperative of the second person singular. And um, so probably the final vowel is not part of the verb stem. Um, yeah, and it can be said that the imperative form of the second person singular, at least in these cases, um, consists of the verb stem and either the final suffix a or a. Um, and what I noticed, I'm, I'm not sure if it's right or not, but it would uh, need some further research as well. Um, I noticed that the, um, subjunctive form um, appears in, in, in only transitive verbs, at least um, that applies to those verbs that, that I asked for. So the intransitive verbs like eat, sleep, drink, and so on, they always have the, uh, the normal a, final a at the end. So, but I'm not sure if that's correct. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, my second question was if there are different imperative forms for the singular and the plural you, and as you can see, there are. So it is um, quite easy. The, um, the plural you, there the infinitive always change um, to an e at the end. So um, drink for, for the um, singular imperative would be moi. And for the plural, we and eat, via and li, sleep, lala and lali, and so on. And my next question was if Ihansu has different imperative forms for people they know well and for people they don't know well maybe strangers even so um, in order to find out if um, people are addre addressed differently i presented to nico two situations um, the first situation was um, imagine you're you're with a friend and you're about to have a cigarette and you would like to offer him one but you don't know whether he smokes and you would want to ask him do you smoke and he said we oui, pepane and then in the se second situation, um, I told him that he is waiting at the bus station with a stranger maybe, and is about to, to um, have a cigarette and he want to be polite and would like to offer him one as well. And he said, we, Pepane, so the forms are completely the same, are completely identical. 
And when I asked him directly if he would say um, the same thing to a friend and uh, to a stranger as well, he confirmed it. Um, then I gave Nico another imperative sentence to translate in different situations. Um, bring or give me water or a glass of water. And in the first situation, the speaker is talking to his child. And then he said, So the um, singular you imperative would be. And um, then the speaker is talking to his children. And he said, I'm not sure if is um, spelled correctly or not, but I was more focused on the verbs. Um, okay, yes, um, that would be the MP would be the um, plural imperative. And in the third situation, um, the speaker is in the house or Nico is in the house of somebody he just met and is talking to his host. And I asked him, what would he say then? And he said, Kulomba Emazia Kumba. So, um, and he translated it is with, um, I beg or I ask for drinking water, please. So he didn't change the, um, the form of the verb. He just um, chose a different lexical verb. So there's probably no specific imperative form for people. Um, uh, hands of speakers don't know, um, but they use other ways to come across more polite. Another question that I had um, and that I mentioned before was how the first person plural imperative forms are built. So the we form. And um, these forms are quite easy to understand and to learn. But um, what surprised me was that there are two different forms depending on how many people you're addressing. So the sentence, let's eat, for instance, <clears throat> is translated allez coulier if the speaker wants themselves and one other, uh, one other person to eat. And if he's talking to at least two people, the correct form would be Ali Kouye, so Ali and Ali. Um, so these affixes um, yeah, appear to always remain the same. So you, add, you just add the prefix Ali or Ali um, to the verb and you turn the final vowel into an E. Um, uh, concerning the middle part, I'm not sure if you just insert the infinitive or if it's the form of the first person plural, which often also starts with a ku in it. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe Andrew can say something about it later on. So. Um, yes, and another thing that, that I noticed um, is that I heard um, Nico say Ali kiligitier instead of Ali kuligitier. And um, the same goes for tambulier. Um, and then Nico, uh, then um, Andrew repeated Ali Kuligitje, and Nico confirmed it. So I wasn't sure if, if both forms are correct or not. Um, I just uh, mentioned both of them. And another thing that is important is um, that the, oh no, that comes later on, sorry. <laughs> Um, I also asked Nico to translate a more indirect directive sentence um, of the first person plural. Um, this is also um, very easy and seems to be also quite regular. And I think there's only one form, so it doesn't matter if you're talking to one or more people. So you get only one form all the time. For instance, I um, asked him to translate, shall we eat? And he said, ne. and shall we sleep? ne. Shall we drink? So it seems to be always the, um, the subjunctive form. The e at the end is um, added. And then um, the ne, which uh, marks a question, needs to be there as well. And it's important that it's, um, that it's after the verb and not at the end of the sentence. Because I, um, at first, I thought I would have to put the ne in order to show that it's a question at the end of the sentence. So um, when I asked him to translate, shall we do our homework? I thought it, it would have be, uh, it would have to be, 
But he said, no, it has to be Hitume ne umule mu wakito because it will change the meaning other ways. Yes, and um, then I was uh, interested if the direct, uh, direct form ali kulie and ali kulie uh, is more often used or the indirect um, question, shall we? Um, but according to Nico, they are both equ used equally often and which one to choose is just uh, just depends on the situation. Another question that I mentioned earlier was if the Hansa speakers also used indirect directive speech acts like questions that we already had, <laughs> um, but also further different forms like, for instance, the German past participle um, for, in certain verbs, for example, in stillgestanden or in hier geblieben. <laughs> and um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, Nico used the sentence Kulomka emadze apungwa which he translated um, by, I beg or I ask for drinking water. Um, so um, I have to admit that I'm not 100% sure if kulampa is a form of an indicative or if it's an imperative mood. But if it's a verb in the indicative, um, as he translated it, this would be an example for an indirect directive speech act, um, more specifically for making a request. And on the last slide, we have seen further examples. Um, for example, coulier, ne. Um, here, a question is used to make an indirect suggestion. But when I, when I asked Nico for further different ways of expressing the same thing, um, nothing came to his mind uh, spontaneously. So it, it can be said that there are uh, ways to um, express speech indirectly, but there, appears, there appears to be no such structures like the past participle, et cetera. Um, or maybe more research would be would be needed. Maybe they just don't come up. You know, these structures maybe it just didn't cross his mind maybe mm -hmm. at the right time. Um, another aspect I was looking for is um, where object pronouns are placed in the sentence and if they have to be or can be directly attached to the verb like in affix. Um, so I asked um, Nico again to translate some sentences, um, for example, take the children to your parents and he translated it with atale ano ako ku aleli ako, which, which means um, literally take children you are to parents you are. And then take them, he translated um, with enso or e enso, to them, ku enso, and take them to them, atale e enso ku enso. And um, another way to say them, he told me, um, for example, take her or him to them, he said, mutale ku kum wow, that would mean the same thing. And um, Take the children to her, to him, in Atale e Anemia Kumwakwe. So Kumwakwe uh, is to is her or him. So that this is always the same word. And um, now, as you can see, um, the verb Atale or Mutale changes according to the object. So Tale is always uh, Tale. It's always the same. But um, the prefix a is attached when it's about a plural object. So when it's about them or the children. And um, mu, um, the prefix mu is used for a singular object. So um, the, the daughter or the child or just her or him. And um, yes, these, these are object markers um, on the verb. And he never left them out. So he always, always pronounced them. And most of the time, he also mentioned the pronoun later in the sentence again, um, like Enzo and, um, and so on. Yes. Or oh, Enzo. Um, but one time he left it out. So when I asked him to say, take her or him to them, he said, Mutale ku Enzo or Mutale ku Enzo. And ku Enzo is just the to them. So the her and him doesn't appear um, once more in the sentence. It's just marked on the verb. 
here. Um, and I have two other um, sentences, eat it, meaning your food. Um, he translate with, she translated with lo ye. So lo would be the it, the um, object marker here, and ye, the imperative form of eat. Um, if you paid attention, then I said earlier that, um, that the second person imperative form of eat is ya, <laughs> and there it's ye, so it's, it's um, turned into the subjunctive form. And he did it all the time, atale, mutale, he always used the, the subjunctive form here. Maybe it has something to do with the object, mm. but that would need uh, some further research, I think, so yes. And another sentence, take it for a walk, and um, by it, uh, I mean the dog. And he said, me hole ume unja unje. And the, there are two verbs here. He used two verbs um, to translate the sentence. Me hole and ume, and the me is always the, um, the object marker. So um, the findings are, it uh, appears to be obligatory that the verb contains a marker for the, at least the direct object. And this marker is attached to the verb um, as a prefix. Uh, and the direct object can be mentioned twice in the sentence, like in, as in mutale, nguenzo, cumwenzo, to take him, her, to him, her, or atale, Anu aku, ku alili aku, take the children to your parents. Um, here the object marker is mentioned and the object itself, not the pronoun, is mentioned. But it's also allowed to leave the, uh, the object pronoun completely out. So mutale ku enso, for take him, her or him to them. Um, Yes, yeah, so now just my conclusion, the answers to my questions um, were that the second person singular imperative probably contains the verb stem of the infinitive and a final um, vowel like a or the subjunctive form a at the end. And Ihanzo speakers do differentiate between the singular and the plural you, um, for instance, moi and we. And yeah, the speakers do not have a specific imperative form for adult people they don't know or who are superior to them in any way. Um, but they have um, something other. Um, yeah, the speakers adapt the first person uh, plural imperative depending on how many people they are addressing. So, ale, ale kule and ali kule. And as an indirect speech act, um, the speakers use questions or, or choose a different lexical verb to, to be more polite. And the object markers need to be attached to the imperative verb and the object, um, if the object is mentioned again in the sentence, um, appears to be optional. And that's it, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Brilliant, Verena. I think from our last talk, I think Stanislav made it quite clear that verbs are complex in Ihanzu, and we still don't know a lot about them. So I'm really pleased that you sort of took these constructions head on and you treated them very seriously. And I think that the analysis is really, is really quite insightful. There's a lot of things here, at least from my perspective, that are quite new and um, are really interesting. And uh, I really appreciate some of the details that you brought out here in your analysis. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to uh, see this talk. So um, yeah, I think that this is, I think that this is great. Um, I will mention in, um, in the analysis of the verb to sleep, we noticed that we saw lal was the, was the root for most of the time. And then we saw with the first person, it was dal for some reason. Now, this is a very common um, uh, phonological operation. If you have an N and an L go together, that L will turn into a D. So that's, a, that's just a phonological operation. Uh, so we could probably pause it with, with, pretty, with a fair degree of certainty that that L is probably there, which just gets changed. But of course, that's an interesting little phonological operation that might not make itself seen clearly until maybe we had more data 
uh, so I think that the analysis, I mean, given the number of verbs that you were working with, I think, you know, it was completely fine. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm really jazzed about the talk. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, anybody in internet, uh, in, in Zoom land right now, if we have any questions or if we have any comments, anybody else? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was, um, it was really interesting. I have a <clears throat> short comment. You um, tested um, for these polite imperatives, right? Um, yes, as well. Can you uh, go back to the slide, please? Do you need these interacting now the water examples? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, so for the third situation, I thought about it. And actually, it would be weird in all languages I know to use a direct imperative. Mm -hmm. Like if you're in the house of somebody you just met, you don't say, give me a water, like, can I have a glass of water? So you might maybe come up with a um, different situation where an imperative has to be used. I don't know. It's, it might be difficult, but I think that form could exist if you just adapted the context, which is mm -hmm. a thought I had. Yes. Yes. So thank you so much. It was really nice um, to hear and to uh, see all this data that you had. Um, I was just wondering um, about the indirect speech act, um, because there you have shall we? Did you by any chance also uh, try with uh, could you? So like, um, could you please, you know, I give me some water or something? I, yes, I think in the beginning I did it, but I didn't mention it in the presentation mm -hmm. because you said, um, um, okay, I think that the example was, can we bring water to our mother or something like that? And I think he said, um, he would say, can we um, to um, express, or maybe it's too late, maybe it's um, getting dark or cetera, something like that, or maybe. Uh, yeah. So whether it's still possible, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't have anything useful for that. <laughs> and did you, so that was also an example with can we, did you also like with just the, you know, some second person singular plus plural, so could you, um, by any so chance? Sure that actually. <laughs> I, I recall you asking a few of these questions, but for some reason we decided to, we decided to leave it for something else. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe maybe something to look at uh, in the uh, future. Yeah, no, I was just wondering whether there was whether there was something because that's something like so from uh, like from a speech act an imperative kind of perspective that is a very common mean uh, means to to just go for it, could you please so asking mm -hmm. for the ability uh, whether it's possible. So I was just wondering whether you also had that. Um, the other point um, that I where I thought it's really nice with the direct object agreement because in the uh, so in the literature on imperatives when you talk about just using the infinitive it's it's usually about no tense marking and no agreement and so what you see in, uh, what you see in Ihanzu is that you don't have any you know it's just like the stem and you but you still get like these agreement forms i mean if they are agreement and not some other kind of <laughs> who knows but uh, but if it's real like true agreement then then this is also very interesting that you actually get these agreements uh, stuff i also liked it very nice with this vowel because with with the with the minimal pair with eat and that pretty much supports your hypothesis that you know mm -hmm. that there is something going on with transitive intransitive uses of, of those verbs mm -hmm. and that that's probably something you know to pick up on and at some point. That was an incredible insight. Yeah, I really, I'm really interested to to go back and take a, a closer look at that. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And the third one is probably more a question to you, Andrew. So uh -oh. uh, with the uh, with the let us, where you had these two different mm -hmm. forms, this looks like a bit like you have a distinction between dual and plural. Yeah. Which, uh, where are Do we you here? Have, um, so the, can you go back to the let's mm -hmm. form? I, I know what you're talking about, but it'd be nice with yes. the, uh, okay. And so I was wondering whether you get, a, whether this is something specific to these imperative forms or whether you've seen dual plural um, distinctions elsewhere in the language by any chance. So any Hanzu, no, I haven't noticed any dual okay. plural distinctions um, in the language. Uh, 
yeah, again, this is this is something else completely uh, completely yeah. novel to me, this Ale versus this Ali. So again, it's new and interesting things. Um, uh, I will note that this vowel change here in let us talk and let us speak. So we have Ale ki ligitie and we have Ale ko ligitie. So here it looks like that I difference is again that reciprocal or that reflexive uh, prefix before the stem. So something like ale ko ligitie would be like, let us talk. And ale ki ligitie would be like, let us talk to each other. And obviously that works because talking and speaking can be something that's done, you know, to within the group. Uh, but yeah, I, I, other, other than that, that first alteration that, that ale versus ali is, uh, is possibly interesting because we're talking about a second verse. We're talking about a, a first person. Yeah, plural distinction here. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. I don't know if Stan or Kyle have any uh, thoughts on that or have any questions of their own. If you guys out in Zoom land do have a question, do feel free to either write it in the chat or to raise your yes, hand. Stan raised his hand, so please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to comment on uh, these Im imperative forms that this topic is broader, I would say, and the imperatives are used uh, as they are face threatening from the perspective of, of the linguistic politeness theory. These are face threatening acts. So it means they're threatening the dignity of the other person. And there are different strategies to redress them so they could sound politely. So the bare infinitive is the, uh, the least polite form. So it's not polite, it's, it's actually, it's rude. But here we should think about who is a beneficiary. So who is benefiting from that action? And if the one who is given a comment is benefiting from it, then there is no need to redress the form. That's why forms like eat, sleep, talk are not redressed with, I don't know, with, 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 with E forms. Mm. But if the beneficiary is the one who is given a comment, so there is a need to redress. That's why this uh, optative form is used. Like in Swahili, right. the, the verb uh, leta, kuleta, is to bring. And when you learn Swahili as a foreign language, this is one of the very few exceptions that you have to memorize at the very beginning. So bring to me should be not leta, but lete, with this you know, polite optative form. So mm -hmm. it might be the case here as well with this E. I don't think it marks the direct object. Otherwise, it sh this should be applicative form. Right. Uh, I think it's worse to, like, to, to test the hypothesis about the beneficiary who is benefiting from that, this action. And another remark about this kulompa it might be influence of Swahili because in Swahili, this naomba functions as please. Yes. You know, this is another expression of please. Naomba, naomba kit fulani. So I would love to have this and this, please. So it might be the influence, or maybe this is a, this is a phenomenon that can be found across Bantu languages, I'm not sure. But in Kenya, they don't use this naomba. Yes. Okay, thank you. There's a few comments I, I'd like to. Thanks, Dan. That's actually really insightful and quite useful. This idea of like, what are the what are the results of the imperative here? Like from a social perspective, maybe this is the reason why we're getting the difference rather than the grammatical perspective. So now we have two competing theories that we can uh, that we can test out. Lovely for some future work. You're going to have to go to uh, Ihanzu next year then. <laughs> Brilliant. 